friends now we will discuss about different steps that are involved in a plant tissue culture experiment. First one is the cleaning and sterilizing of the glass or the plastic ware followed by preparation and sterilization of the culture media. We are going to discuss each and every step in detail as well. Third is the selection and sterilization of the explant material that has to be placed on the artificial culture media for proper growth. Preparation and sterilization of inoculation area that is the area where you place the explant onto the culture media. Next step is the inoculation or the transfer of the explant onto the media and last is the maintenance and subculturing of the culture. So coming on to the cleaning of glassware or the plasticware. It is always advisable that whatever apparatus whether it is of glass or plastic you are using in the plant tissue culture experiment it should be soaked overnight in the laboratory detergent. If you are using a glassware, it is always preferred to store that glassware in chromic acid overnight, then wash it with detergent, finally with water. If you are using any kind of contaminated vials or tubes, contaminated means they have already been used in the previous experiments. So before washing those contaminated vials or tubes, they should be autoclaved. So in order to prevent any kind of infection to be transferred into the personnel who is washing them or into the water, they should before washing they should always be autoclaved. Many times it happens that the apparatus which you are going to use has already been used for previous culture studies and it may have remnants of agar in it. So in order to remove the agar remnants from the glassware or the plasticware, before washing such kind of apparatus, it should be heated. Now by heating that apparatus, it causes melting of the agar which can be drained from that glassware or plasticware and after that it can be properly washed. Once the glassware has been washed or soaked in chromic acid overnight and after that it has been washed with detergent, finally the glassware or the plasticware is washed with double distilled water. After washing with distilled water, it is stored under an air current at a temperature of 75 degrees for proper drying. Now, once the apparatus is being washed properly, the next step is to sterilize that glassware or the plasticware. Autoclaving is the method of choice for sterilizing glassware and the plasticware and it has been found that autoclaving at a temperature of 121 degrees Celsius at 15 psi pressure for 20 minutes is sufficient to sterilize such kind of apparatus. One can always go for dry sterilization or dry heating sterilization also wherein the glassware specifically is sterilized by this method wherein the glassware is heated at a temperature of 160 to 180 degrees Celsius for 3 hours in order to achieve proper sterilization. Now once the apparatus is sterilized, it should be allowed to cool in oven itself because if you remove the glassware in hot condition, it will attack, attract cool air which can get condensed and again will bring certain contamination like microorganisms along with it which can deposit on the surface of the glassware. So such kind of practice should always be avoided. Now the plasticware uh, which is being used in the tissue culture experiments as I told you that autoclaving is the method of choice for sterilization. So plasticware can also be sterilized under autoclaving by autoclaving using similar kind of conditions but there are different types of plastics that can be repeatedly autoclave or they cannot be autoclave. Over the period of time, lot of advancements have been made in the plasticware and nowadays polypropylene, polymethyl pentene polyalomer, tefzel which is ETFE and teflon which is also known as FEP, such kind of plastic material can be repeatedly autoclave, specifically ETFE and 
Teflon. Now it has been found these material are stable at a temperature up to 260 degrees Celsius and beyond uh, that they start losing the mechanical strength and certain leaching of the ions is also uh, have been found when they are exposed to higher temperatures beyond 260 degrees Celsius. Polycarbonate plastic material it has been found that if it is autoclave for more than 20 minutes it loses considerable amount of mechanical strength. So and polystyrene, polyvinyl chloride, styrene, acryl nitrile they, these plastic wear should never be autoclave. So depending upon the plastic wear you are using you can select the sterilizing method, you can uh, uh, select the way by which you are sterilizing the plastic wear. Next step is the preparation of the culture media. The science of culture media preparation has come a long way. Various types of medias have been developed by different scientific groups that are working in this plant tissue culture field. Some of the most widely used or most common culture medias that have been developed in yester years include Murshag and Skoog media which was developed in 1962. Then Linsmere and Skoog media which was modification of MS, uh, uh, MS media and this uh, Linsmere and Skoog media was further developed in 1965. Then came the Gambog media which is also known as B5 media in 1968. Then N6 media which was developed by Chu and his group in 1978. Then Nish and Nish media which was popularly known as NN media in 1969 and so on so forth. So as I told you that the science of preparing culture media has developed has come a long way since 1860 when NOP solution was developed and uh, if we look into the list of the media which I have displayed MS media that was developed in 1962 is still the most popular and widely used culture media obviously certain modifications are always there in MS media as per the requirement of the cultural studies but still MS media is the most widely used culture media. If you look into the composition of culture media, we can broadly categorize the ingredients into inorganic nutrient, uh, in, inorganic material, then organic nutrients and apart from inorganic and organic nutrients, we also have certain natural complexes, antioxidants, antibiotics and so on so forth. First coming on to the inorganic nutrients which can be broadly categorized into macro and micronutrients. Now macronutrients as their name indicates they are required in a concentration of more than 10 millimolar per kg of the dry mass of the media or the uh, culture whereas micronutrients are required in a concentration of less than 10 millimolar per kg mass of the dry area. Now most of these nutrients are supplied in the form of salts. So coming on to the macronutrient first, first one is the calcium which is largely given in the form of calcium nitrate or calcium chloride. Now calcium is has been found to be an important constituent of cell wall. It has also been found to be involved in the regulation of hormone responses or the growth regulator responses in the culture media or in the plant development and has been found to have a preemptive role in the morphogenesis of the culture. Its deficiency has been found to lead the necrosis of the shoot tip wherein it can hamper the morphogenesis of the culture or the callus. Second macronutrient is potassium which is important for normal cell division and synthesis of protein and chlorophyll in the plant. Third one is magnesium which is given in the form of magnesium sulphate and we know that magnesium is an important component of the chlorophyll molecule. Followed by magnesium is the nitrogen. We know that nitrogen is an important constituent of amino acids, certain vitamins or nucleic acids and certain proteins. Now nitrogen has been found to affect the growth by 
influencing the pH of the media. It has also been found that nitrogen plays an important role in somatic embryogenesis in the cell and in the growth of callus in different types of callus cultures. Moving further, we have sulfur, again is an important co uh, component of certain proteins or amino acids and has been found to promote the development of roots. Phosphorus is another macronutrient which is vital for cell division and we know that for phosphorus is an important component for the energy source of cell that is ATP or ADP or AMP. Now we move on to different micronutrients as I told you that these are the nutrients that are required at a concentration less than 10 millimolar per kg of the dry mass. So first one is boron and it has been found that boron enhances the movement of sugar across different cells that are present in the culture. Then we have manganese which activates various enzymes that are involved in photosynthesis or respiration or nitrogen metabolism. Then we have zinc which is largely given in the form of zinc sulphate and has been found to activate various enzymes especially carboxylases and these enzymes has also been found or zinc has also been found to play an important role in the synthesis of one of the most important growth regulators that is auxin. Next we have as iron which is again given in the form of ferrous sulphate and we know that iron play an important role in the functioning of certain enzymes like cytochrome enzymes or oxidative enzymes or peroxidases or catalases which play an important role in scavenging free radicals in order to protect the plant from oxidative stress. Then we have copper which is again a part of certain important oxidative enzymes which again play an important role in protecting the cells from the oxidative stress. Molybdenum is another important component of nitrate reductase enzyme, nitrogenase enzyme and therefore help in the metabolism of nitrogen so that nitrogen atoms are available for the growth of the culture. Next we have is iodine which is given in the form of potassium iodide. Uh, many reports have shown that iodine is not essential for the growth of the plant or the culture but it, it has been found that certain media use iodine in order for proper protein synthesis in the culture cells. Now in order for, in order to improve the availability of iron over the wide pH range because we know that pH range also plays an important role in preparation of the culture media or growth of the culture. So in order to make the availability of iron in proper concentrations over the wide pH range, iron is always given in the chelated form along with EDTA. It is always preferred to give along with EDTA. Now we move on to the organic nutrients. Now organic nutrients again will have various components like carbohydrate sources there, vitamins are there, amino acids are there and so on and so forth. So starting with vitamins, we all know that vitamins they act as coenzymes in different uh, functions, physiological functions of the plant cells. They enhances the cellular responses in the culture and most widely used vitamins are thiamine also known as vitamin B1 nicotinic acid also known as niacin or vitamin B3 and pyridoxin which is also known as vitamin B6. Apart from these commonly used vitamins, folic acid, ascorbic acid, riboflavin, pentothenic acid and tocopherols and biotin these are also other vitamins that are used as per the requirement in different types of culture medias. Coming on to the second component of organic nutrients that is amino acids. Now by and large it has been found that amino acids they act as a source of reduced nitrogen. It has also been found that the nitrogen requirement is fulfilled by the inorganic constituents of the media. 
uh, later on it was also found that some of the amino acids also play an important role in morphogenesis and therefore nowadays small amounts of certain important amino acids are added into the culture media. Like l tyrosine has been found to cause the initiation of shoot system into the cells, arginine has been found to facilitate the rooting in the cultured cells, serine helps in obtaining the haploid embryos whereas glutamine has been found to enhance the somatic embryogenesis. So depending upon the type of culture you are doing, depending upon your requirement if you are going for somatic uh, cultures then glutamine is the amino acid of choice. If you want to have shoot system to be flourishing in the culture then l tyrosine amino acid is of choice. Likewise if you want to have more root system to be developed then arginine is the amino acid of choice. So depending upon your requirement, depending upon your culture study you have to select the amino acid. Next organic component are the plant growth regulators. I will not go into the details of these growth regulators because I have discussed in detail the function of these growth regulators in the lecture series on plant hormones. But briefly I will uh, give an overview of the functions of various growth regulators that are being used in plant tissue culture studies. By and large if we see that auxins and cytokinins are the two class of growth regulators that are widely used in the plant tissue culture studies. So coming on to the auxins, we know that auxins have an important function in stem elongation, in cell division, they, they promote apical dominance, they also have a role in cytodifferentiation and depending upon the concentration of auxin that is used in the culture, we can also initiate rooting. As we know that low concentration of auxin in comparison to cytokinins will initiate root system and high concentration will initiate the shoot system. Now we know that auxins are both natural and synthetic and the most common natural auxins that are used in plant tissue culture studies are indole acetic acid or indole 3 butyric acid which are used for rooting and shoot initiation whereas synthetic uh, derivatives are naphthalene acetic acid for root and shoot initiation and 2,4-dichlorophenoxy acetic acid for callus induction and inducing somatic embryogenesis. These are some other uh, synthetic auxins that are being used for different functions like 245T for callus inductions, 3,6-dichloro anisic acid that is specifically used in monocot cultures and so on and so forth. Now as we discussed that while preparing a culture media, various ingredients are to be prepared in the form of stock solutions. And for preparing stock solutions, specifically in case of vitamins and growth regulators, we have to prepare their stock solutions and later on we can, depending upon the required concentration, we dilute those stock solutions and use in the culture media. So for preparing the stock solution of auxins, we utilize specified amount of auxin which is generally 10 milligram and it is taken in a appropriate volume of beaker. It is dissolved in few drops of one normal sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide and then 90 ml of double distilled water is added making up to the final volume of 100 ml. So this forms the stock solution. Now auxins can always be, uh, they can solubilize in 95% ethanol or alkali. But for uh, culture media, it is always preferred to solubilize auxins in water. Certain precautions has, have to be taken while preparing the auxin stock solutions. It has been found that auxins, though they are stable at, uh, at a temperature range of 110 to 120 degrees Celsius, but up to 1 hour for, uh, at atmospheric pressure. Therefore, it is always advisable to prepare the stock solutions of auxin freshly whenever they have to be used. In a study it was found that there is a considerable degradation of auxin over a period of time. When a freshly prepared media was analyzed, 
the oxygen concentration was found to be 200 microgram per 100 ml of the media. When that media was sterilized using autoclaving, the amount of oxygen got degraded and it reduced to 182, roughly 183 microgram per 100 ml. On storage of the stock solution for 3 days in darkness, the oxygen further degrade and the amount reduced to 180 microgram. When that stock solution was stored in light for 3 days, there was a considerable degradation of the oxygen content in the media and it was hardly 3 microgram per 100 ml of the media. And therefore, it is always advisable to prepare the stock solutions of auxins freshly whenever they have to be used in the media. Second class of the growth regulators is the cytokinins and we know that cytokinins have been found to trigger cell division. They also induce differentiation of shoots and roots. Shoot prol uh, proliferation is occurring by the release of uh, apical dominance because we know that cytokinins have an antagonistic actions on uh, with respect to auxins in terms of apical dominance. Auxins lead to apical dominance and cytokinins, they antagonize that apical dominance, they release the auxiliary buds from apical dominance and leads to the development of shoot system. Most widely used cytokinins in plant tissue culture are kinetin, benzyl aminopurine, 2 isopentanyl adenine, zeatin and thediazurion. So, these are the most common. Recently, another class of cytokinins known by the name of topolins is becoming more popular in plant tissue culture laboratories. Again, these topolins are also naturally occurring cytokinins and they have been found to be hydroxylated analogs of, of uh, 6-benzyl aminopurine. Now, these topolins have exhibited certain advantages over the conventional cytokines and they have been found to exhibit a high rate of shoot multiplication. These topolins have been found to reduce various kinds of physiological abnormalities that develop over the period of time in the growth of the cultures and they have also been found to provide better rooting system in the callus and better acclimatization of the culture that is being developed under the artificial conditions. One of the most commonly used topolin in the plant tissue culture study is metatopolin. Coming on to the preparations of the stock solution of cytokinins, the method is same as that of auxins except the crystals of cytokinins are dissolved in one normal HCl or few drops of water. Unlike auxins, cytokinins can be stored for longer duration under refrigerated conditions in comparison to auxins. Third category is of gibberlins. Now, gibberlins have been uh, found to have a very limited use in plant tissue culture study. They stimulate the elongation of internodes. They have been found to stimulate the meristem growth of some species. They also help in attaining normal development of plantlets from the in vitro formed embryos in the culture studies. And But the major problem with gibberlins is that they are highly thermolabile and cannot be autoclaved. Ethylene is another growth regulator which is a byproduct of uh, the culture. And it has been found that ethylene is produced during the plant tissue culture studies also. And this production is largely attributed to the organic constituents that are present in the media and whenever that media is exposed to heat or its oxidation is there or it is sterilized using UV radiations. It also causes rapidly growing non-differentiated callus or suspension cultures. Ethylene has been found to affect embryogenesis and organogenesis and the effect of ethylene varies from different plant species. Abscisic acid which is also known as a growth inhibitor is also required but again in a very limited 
culture studies for the normal growth and development of the embryos. Again, it is photosensitive, but it is heat stable. So friends, this was about the requirement of plant growth regulators in the media. In the next lecture, we will discuss about the other organic components of the culture media that are required for the preparation of the culture media. Thank you.